All right, thank you everyone for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, we welcome you to this uh, workshop, um, Martin Luther King Nonviolence and the Beloved Community. Um, we're very pleased today to have our workshop uh, leader, uh, Dr. Vincent Lewis, uh, who's known, I think, to all of you who are uh, on, so I won't give him an extensive uh, introduction. Some of you saw the video that uh, Vince and I did this week to uh, give a little promotion for this um, uh, session, and um, as Vince shared, and he'll probably share with us further, of course, uh, this has been uh, this topic of uh, the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, is um, uh, a topic of lifelong interest. Uh, and uh, so we're really fortunate, I believe, to have this opportunity today to take a, a deep look at nonviolence in an important time in the life of the church when uh, nonviolence is uh, coming up as a, a topic for uh, action at World Conference and discussion. We'll be getting a report from the First Presidency uh, on this. And so um, you certainly can't talk about the topic of nonviolence without talking about uh, the major contribution to the uh, practice and thought of nonviolence by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So with that brief introduction, Vince, I want to uh, welcome you and thank you so much for your hard work in preparing for this and uh, we are recording the session so that uh, we have the ability for people to see this uh, at a later time but we're really looking forward to today thank you uh, thank you very much Glenn and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us registering and joining us and um, um, we're going to move right along and the key factor in our time together today will be you in that periodically we will, uh, because of the size of our group, rather than probably break out in small group sessions, um, we would like to open them, have you open your mic and go ahead and share with the group. I think there's much to be learned from each other and I'd like for us to go ahead and feel comfortable about planning to share our experience. Uh, I trust that we will not necessarily um, uh, talk about other people's comments but talk in reference to your experience regarding the topic at hand. Um, first of all, as we begin to, to delve into Dr. Martin Luther King, I wanna know a little bit about you in regards to why you have chosen to take part in this rather lengthy workshop today and um, what you hope to receive from that and I am going to show you some of Dr. Martin Luther King's quotes. Um, I would like to know which of his quotes resonates the most with you. Um, yes. So while you're thinking, I'd like, to, I'd like for you to share with us which of his quotes resonate most with you. I will show you that my attempt to show you which my direction button is not working. Um, top 10 quotes. Glenn, why isn't my arrow, why isn't this advancing? Let's see, you may want to use the, the, uh, the down arrow on your keyboard to advance the slides. Yeah, I am, and uh, that's not going either direction. It's... Okay. Click, click right on the slide to make sure it's in the foreground and then try it. Okay, now, now try the arrow key or, oh. There we go, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so back to the question again. <clears throat> Which of Dr. Dr. Queen's quotes resonates with you most uh, currently, and why would that be? And some of them, if you do not have one at the top of your head, um, I'll let you read, peruse these real quick, and then I will go to the next five.
Okay, so I'd like for us to take some time for you to go ahead and open your mic, if you will, and share with us um, either those that we just showed or those one that you may have in your head and may have um, um, gained a relationship with sometime in the past. Uh, share with us uh, a Martin Luther King quote that you that resonates with you. I certainly enjoy all of them. This is Gwendolyn. Uh, but the first one, I think, about uh, the fact that we must all live as brothers or we'll all perish as fools, uh, says to me that there was a link between all of humanity. And it upholds the idea that because we're all related, what I do or do not do will affect others. Uh, sometimes because of our relationship with another person, it's immediate. Other times it's through what happens in society because of my actions or inactions. So for me, that is a powerful message. Thank you, Gwendolyn. That's, thank you for joining us this morning. Who's next? I like the one, uh, the time is always right to do what is right. Um, it, and I, and I think there's one that's maybe not on the screen that's uh, that was not on the screen that's the the long arc of history always bends toward justice or something like that. Um, I don't know if I had the words exactly right, but uh, I've always appreciated that one as well. Thank you, Glenn. <clears throat> this is Ron, and um, the one that really hits me all the time is to judge a man by his character, not by the color of his skin. Um, when I was in high school, I actually did the uh, I have a dream speech as a as a drama event, and uh, he's always been a part of, of my background in thinking about that is that people should respect people by what they can be and who they are and not by what they look like. So that always uh, resonates with me. Thank you, thank you Ron. <clears throat> For me, the quote of hate cannot drive out hate, only love can is one for me. And the other of the ones you shared is for uh, individuals to be judged by character, uh, not by other characteristics, but by the character of that person. Great, great. Thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, we'll have more opportunity to swing back around and share from uh, some of Dr. King's quotes at a later time. So moving forward a little bit, I want to tell you a little bit about why um, I happen to choose to study and learn and get very passionate about Dr. Martin Luther King. Earlier in my life, as all of us, um, as, as an African-American male or as an African-American person, uh, during the beginning of the civil rights movement, during the uh, Rosa Parks era, uh, and starting with that, and um, a lot of our uh, leaders of color became very verbal and, um, and uh, trying to guide uh, people as to which direction we should go. And we have two of our key ones there, uh, Malcolm X and of course, Dr. Martin Luther King. And um, uh, then we don't have a picture here of, of, um, of uh, Louis Farrakhan uh, with, with the Nation of Islam. And those leaders that had a lot to say and a lot of opinions regarding which direction we should go. We should all be working for change and looking for change and looking for equality and freedom and so forth. But how do we go about getting that? And so as a young child, um, I think that I was something I was, I was forced to make a decision as to which methodology that I would stand by and I would support and resonates the most, most with me. And um, I began reading, reading and studying both uh, Malcolm X as well as Dr. Martin Luther King. And it was 
it was during my study of Martin Luther King, especially his childhood, we'll talk about that the similarities and the overlap were so distinct that um, I chose to go with Martin Luther King. Now, uh, Martin Luther King's profession of nonviolence is not something that I had embedded with in my household, in my family and growing up. Uh, that that was a no given. I mean, it was it was an idea that it must be nonviolence because that's what I grew up with. I did not necessarily grow up with that, and and we got the stitches to 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 prove it, or the scars to prove that. But the more I read and learned about both of these gentlemen, um, and the more it convinced me that uh, Martin Luther King's uh, theology regarding nonviolence was most impactful for me and what I wanted to learn more about. So let's dig into the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, if you will. So, <clears throat> first of all, um, first of all, he was he was uh, born uh, Michael Luther King. Both he and his father, when he was born, Michael Luther King, that was also Junior. That was also the, the name of his father, and. Um, um, his father, Michael uh, uh, Luther King, at that time, uh, began studying Martin Luther, and he was very intrigued by the words of Martin Luther regarding justice for all, regarding equality, regarding working hard for it, regarding nonviolence. And uh, Martin, or Michael, or Martin Luther King Sr., was so intrigued by the study and the teaching and the writing and the statements of Martin Luther, um, he decided to change their name, his name, as well as his son's name. So um, Michael Luther King Jr. became Martin Luther King Jr. And this was way back in 1929. Um, um, and Martin tells the story at a young age of the time that he had a very good friend that was approximately the same age, and they played a lot, and they were together a lot. Um, they did everything together, and when it came time for his uh, starting school, the young friend of his, the young Caucasian friend of his, was told that he could no longer play and interact with Martin Luther King Jr. And Martin was very taken back by that. And he asked his mother, and why is it that his, this buddy cannot play with him any longer? Why is it that they are not speaking any longer? And his mother had to tell him that it was because of our color. It is because that we are Negro that he cannot any longer interact with us. Um, and that broke Martin Luther's heart a lot. But Martin reports in his biography that the thing that shook him the most is that when he was approximately eight years old, he and his grandmother went to town to buy a pair of shoes. Now we know at that time, um, that era, that um, women and our, our, our mothers, our grandmothers, our matriarchs, um, our spiritual leaders were never called by their name, given the right and the privilege, Mrs., uh, Ms., uh, or whatever, they were still told and called by pretty, pretty disrespectful <laughs> titles. African-American uh, males and, and, and in general, either boy or uh, other derogatory names and very seldom seen as having value and called by their titles. I think we all are aware of that. This particular day, when Martin went, went uh, shoe shopping with his grandmother, they walked into a shoe store and the <coughs> shoe store said that they must go directly to the back if they want service. Grandmother decided she wanted her service up front and she wanted to try out a pair of shoes up front. Mm -hmm. uh, Result, uh, grandmother was kicked out of the store and Martin were kicked out of the store. And of course, Martin inquired of grandmother what was going on there and why did that happen? And grandmother again informed Martin 
that it's because of the color of their skin and the disrespect that is very prevalent at that time with, at that time, Negro um, men and women. <laughs> Martin Luther King in his biography states that that is the, the angriest he had been thus far in his life. And so he then began to engage and decide that he is going to uh, advocate for peace and justice for all. And uh, in fact, later when he entered uh, middle school, he told his grandmother that what he wants is some big words. And my goal is to have some big words so I can convince people what is right and what and how to do right. This is a picture of Martin at a very young age and his parents in back. This is um, Eb Eb Ebenezer Church. This is where Martin's father was the pastor. Uh, Martin Luther King Sr. was the pastor. And this will be the first church that Martin Jr. became, uh, started, started his ministry at. Um, now, Martin uh, graduated from uh, high school at the age of 15. Oh. He graduated from high school. Simultaneously, in that same year, he uh, took the entrance exam for Morehouse College, and he did pass that entrance exam. So at the age of 15, he entered Morehouse College, uh, where he is a very, very strong academic student. And in fact, it was just three years later that he graduated from Morehouse College. And he, hmm. and with that, he began his ministry. Um, very impactful, but also simultaneously, during his time in Morehouse College, he met Claretta. Um, and uh, Claretta Scott, and so she was very, uh, as you know, a, a very major part of his life and of, of his movement. She supported him all the way and, and everything that he did. And they had, they courted for a, probably about a year. And after which time they obviously did get married. Now, Claretta was the daughter of the pastor of the Dexter, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And so when Martin uh, graduated from seminary and was ready to start peach, preaching, he became the pastor of the Dexter Avenue uh, Church and uh, where Loretta's father was the, the pastor. Now, I thought that was pretty interesting and in, in the relationship in regards to transitioning and you know, in the relationship came with a, and the marriage came with a pastoring of a church, um, big step. Now, it was during this time that he was pastor of Dexter Avenue Church and he was studying and talking about the equal treatment of all people and the fairness of our laws or the and how unjust some of them may be and more so what we should be doing about that um, versus just talking about that. Now, <clears throat> this is the part that I, I find very intriguing and personally very um, uh, exciting, excited about because the same time I was reading about Dr. Martin Luther King, I was uh, studying and hearing about this person called um, James Lawson, uh, Reverend and Dr. James Lawson. Um, Um, oh, okay. So Reverend Dr. James Lawson, um, he was a student of, of uh, Gandhi and uh, he studied Gandhi. He, ob he, ob he even went as far as he went to India and he, and I had thought earlier that he had met with and studied with Gandhi, but he did not, just as Martin, by the 
started preparing for this and I started doing some deep, deep dives in some areas that I had not done before. I was under the understanding that, that both James Lawson as well as Martin Luther studied with Gandhi, but they did not. They went to India and studied Gandhi and they did not have a chance to meet and sit with him as I expected earlier. But not that that's a relevant factor, but it is, but they studied Gandhi just as we now have the opportunity to do. But Lawson was so impressed with Gandhi's practice of nonviolence that he came back to the United States and became a major, major advocate of, of uh, nonviolence. And um, um, James Lawson contacted Dr. King and Dr. King went up to the university where James was teaching at the time. And they had very, very good conversations regarding methodologies and getting things done better for the Negro people and more equal, equal treatment of all people, of the poor, of the pride, the marginalized, of all people. And what method is best to do that, the nonviolent method in how to proceed with that. And James Lawson work was, re was recognized, it's seldom recognized in that uh, it was very impactful, but not a lot of people are aware of James Lawson, but in his work. Um, I too have read all of his stuff and most of as I could find and very impressed with him. Well, um, a few years back, in fact, in 2004, um, the church had what we called the Peace Colloquy at that time. And most of us, and most of us remember the Peace Colloquy. I was asked to come and give a talk at the Peace Colloquy and uh, regarding my experience with uh, uh, racial mistreatment or racial bias uh, here in the Midwest. And I obviously uh, said yes to that opportunity. And little did I know until after I said yes, that also on the bill at the Peace Colloquy was Dr. James Lawson. And he um, was, he came and he, he, he spoke um, and much to my surprise and my enjoyment, when I checked into the hotel, the, well, it was a, the previously owned by the church right across from the temple. Um, and my wife and I were in the lounge downstairs checking in and Dr. Lawson was there. And in fact, even the next morning when I introduced myself and spoke with him at that time uh, and how much I was enamored by his work. And then uh, when we came down for breakfast the next, next, next morning, he and his wife were at that restaurant and um, uh, or kind of a dining area of the hotel. And my wife and I had an opportunity to break bread with him that morning and I had an opportunity to hear him and talk to him and visit with him. And I'm very, very proud of our church in that they took the opportunity and gave him at that time in that gathering, the International Peace Award. Um, and our, our church, I'm very proud of our church, of them not only recognizing, but acknowledging and supporting the acts of nonviolence uh, going back as far as Dr. Lawson. So uh, that's just my personal preference and personal little opinion there. But I wanna show you a little bit more uh, regarding Dr. Lawson and with, with um, uh, Congressman Lewis. The architect of the nonviolent resistance, the man who wrote the blueprint for the plan, and the giant who executed it beautifully. Our next panel. We often hear people don't need an introduction. Well, this is gospel. Neither of these civil rights icons needs me to say anything more than their name. Can I please get you on your feet to welcome to the stage the great Congressman John Lewis. And remain on your feet, ladies and gentlemen, for the man who is the blueprint, the creator, the architect of it all, Reverend James Lawson. Give these men the honor they so greatly
rightfully have earned from all of us here. We're going to get right to it because there is no time to waste. If you've watched the news, if you've read a paper, you know the time is now. Congressman, let's talk about where we are. Millions of people around this country marched in defiance against what they see are gun laws that are not serving the people. Where are we today as it relates to the ability to sustain a movement, to keep it going 50 years after Dr. King's assassination. Well, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here tonight, to be with you, to be with my teacher, my friend, my brother, Jim Lawson. My philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to say something, to do something. You cannot afford to be quiet. I think we're going to continue to go forward. These children, these young people, the women of America, but especially the young people are going to get us there. I am very hopeful and very optimistic that these young people will be the leaders of the 21st century. Reverend Lawson, seeing what we've witnessed as Congressman Lewis said, these young people, the women, the young women on this stage today that are carrying the lessons that you taught Dr. King, that you taught Congressman Lewis, how does it make you feel to see those very tools that you came back with implemented? You want me to speak the truth or you just want me to talk? The truth and nothing <laughs> but the truth, so help us God. <laughs> <clears throat> well, number one, I'm going to say my observation is that most activism in the United States today is the activism of the USA and is largely cultural activism. What do you mean by that? I mean by that that the lessons from the Rosa Parks King movement which is a separate entity from what's called the Civil Rights Movement, was a different kind of movement. It was a movement that recognized in the first instance that each one of us had power in the very gift of life and that we had to use the gift of life that's a precious gift from creation we have to use that gift of life and exploit it on the noble sides of humanity to learn to be as alive as we could become, to discover that with the gift of life is the gift of love, and that love is the energy of the universe and is the creative force of the universe, and that if we want to have a struggle, then movement must come out of that first. It cannot come out of a culture of violence. It cannot come out of a culture that has for too long pretended to be a land of the free and a home of the brave, while doing the most horrible kinds of things and developing a torturous history that has poisoned the airways in the United States in ways that we do not know. And then in addition to that, if we use a struggle that comes out of the gift of life, the gift of love, the gift of truth, that has to be essentially a nonviolent movement. And a nonviolent movement requires a sense of reason that says if you want social change, you have to be and you have to do the things that produce social change. If you want justice, you must become just people. A struggle for justice must be itself 
a justice struggle. If you want freedom and access, then your movement must not reflect the enemies of human life, but must reflect equality and liberty and the dignity of all life. Yes. And so Congressman th there's, no, there's no alternative to that. You cannot overcome wrong with doing wrong. You cannot overcome evil with evil. Uh, as Gandhi said it very well in the words of Jesus, an eye for an eye, soon everyone is blind. A tooth for a tooth, soon everyone is blind. You can't get a new society by planting the seeds of the old society. If you want a new society, you have to plant the seeds that produces a new society. Jesus of Nazareth, and I say that name without all the dogma wrapped around him, insisted that you cannot get grapes from a briar bush. <laughs> yes. Well, you have to get grapes from a grapevine. So how do we today get that love, the resistance, the humanity back into the movement? I well, think if you'd ask anyone here, are they a just person, they would say yes. One of the problems of our society is the fact that we are romantic science of society. We think every generation is going to change us, but we mold every generation with straight up and down USA culture. So how do you get a new world from a new generation using the tactics of the society in which they live? What is the answer, Congressman? Uh, well, what is the answer, Reverend Lawson? The high school movement has a good beginning. That is, they know that enough is enough, and they want to see, they want to have the capacity of a society where they can operate learning across their years, especially as young people, in safety, without the violence, without the guns. Congressman. So that's a good goal. But, I like the goal. <laughs> but Jim Lawson has been my teacher. Yes. He's been my uh, leader. When I was very young, had all my hair and a few pounds lighter, this man imbues me with the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of Gandhi. My advice for the young people today is to study the movement. Read the literature, watch the films, the videos, and accept nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. When we were beaten, arrested, and jailed, we accepted it. During the 60s, I was beaten and left bloody, unconscious. I thought I was going to die on that bridge. I thought I saw death during the Freedom Rise in 1961 when black people and white people can be seated together on a Greyhound bus or a trailway bus leaving Washington, D.C. to travel through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. We were on our way to New Orleans. And Jim Lawson and others of us were arrested. We went to jail. More than 400 people, black and white, went to jail in Mississippi. But we didn't strike back. We didn't give up, we didn't give in, we kept the faith. And our action led to the desegregation of public transportation all across the American South. So okay, so I would like for us to talk a little bit, to share a little bit with each other. Um, what you've heard, any questions that you may have, at this point regarding anything that you have heard. When people said nothing. Feel free to un unmute your mic and uh, please share um, either what we've talked about thus far regarding uh, Martin Luther King's life and journey and growing up and uh, his first church uh, his graduation, 
uh, anything regarding Dr. Uh, James, James Lawson, uh, the words of James Lawson, the words of uh, John Lewis, anything that you have heard thus far that you would like to share with us about? Uh, Vince? Yes. This is Barbara. I'm in Lamoni. Yes, Barbara. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm very grateful to even know the name of James Lawson. I've never heard of that name before. I'm very impressed with his example for all of us. Um, and uh, the thing that strikes me the most, I, act I actually don't have a question. I have just a comment here. Um, that strikes me about James Lawson, um, John Lewis, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, um, Rosa Parks, any of those names bring to me the um, strength of their courage. And for me, uh, they mentioned also Jesus. And for me, he's the standard bearer of courage. There was nothing that uh, he well, wouldn't address. I will show you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Barb. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get it back to start to start at the end. Um, anyone else would like to share? Yeah, I have a question, Vince. Um, so uh, the influence that James Lawson had on Dr. King, um, w was he really the person who pointed uh, uh, Dr. King towards the teachings of Gandhi, or did they kind of discover that interest simultaneously? So that's that's my first question, and then I'll have another one after that. <laughs> so Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Lawson and Dr. King met personally face to face uh, when in 1954. Um, King uh, graduated in '54 as well and was starting his his ministry, um, and he had heard. Of, they had heard of each other. And uh, uh, James Lawson summons Dr. King. Dr. King went to see him. Dr. King, during their time together, tried to convince James Lawson to use leave the university that he was at and come move down to Montgomery and come and help with this movement, which he did. Montgomery did. I mean, James Lawson did uh, move down to Montgomery. Um, but in 1959 is when... Um, uh, Dr. King and Cloretta uh, went to India and spent some time there studying up close and personal the works the, the, and deeper the works of uh, Gandhi. Okay, and then uh, my second question, Vince, relates to uh, uh, Howard Thurman and sort of how, his, how did his influence play? And maybe you're gonna talk about that later, I don't know, but wasn't he also one of the major influences on Dr. King? He was, and Howard Thurman as a, as a very, uh, very active lawyer for civil rights and working directly with the NAACP and working a little bit more directly with those that were arrested and incarcerated regarding their sentence and uh, the fairness of their sentence and the whole injustice thing. So um, yes, Howard Thurman played a major, major role during that civil rights movement as well. Uh, he and there's not a lot of information about he and Dr. King walking together, but they were doing their, their work, their hard work towards civil rights and legal justice at the same time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Any other comments or statements? Um this is Dee, and I just wanted to say I'm just enthralled with listening to James Lawson. Um, I don't remember if I've heard of him in the past or not, but um, I've been taking notes. I wish there was a transcript to what he's saying because I can't write fast enough to get everything down that I would like to remember that he's saying. But the basic idea that you know we can't plant new seeds with the old. And that applies to a lot of things other than, you know, talking about racial justice and things. But yeah, he just has so many wonderful things to say. And it, it makes me think of what the church stands for and what we're trying to do. Yes. And I would encourage everyone, all of us, and even myself continuously, is to go ahead and YouTube 
um, Dr. James Lawson uh, or James Lawson. And there are a number of different uh, videos, uh, short and long, um, of, his, of his statements, as well as John Lewis as too a student of James Lawson. So uh, yeah, thank you, Dee. Um, he does have some very significant and important things to say. Um, this is Francis. Yes, ma'am. And I too am enthralled uh, with Mr. Lawson's words. And uh, there's a Dr. Lawson. I'm, yeah, but, same, Reverend Dr. Lawson. Yeah. Reverend, sorry, sorry. Uh, Reverend, I hadn't um, heard of him before either that I'm aware of, but yes, I uh, it, his message there just resonated. Um, what it made me think of when he was talking about the young people studying these things, it, it just makes me think about our um, church curriculum for youth and uh, how it would be a nice thing if uh, materials were developed, especially, I suppose, for our teenagers, senior high, um, that was developed around, uh, around those concepts and around these people. Um, I know they learn it in school, but it's always a different focus or not as broader as not as broader as in depth as what we probably could do sometimes in Sunday school. Maybe. Very true. Thank you, Brent. One comment uh, I have at this point is just the fact that out of the small group we have here, uh, persons who have not heard of Dr. Lawson, which points out to me how critical it is that we have inclusive history, that uh, things that children learn in school, uh, that information that we're not aware of about other cultures, how critically important it is that we be made aware. I say that because I think it increases our ability to understand each other better and understand um, what life is like or has been like for those persons who are different from us. So I'm very pleased that you're presenting this part of history and, and would um, recommend that we all stay abreast and stay aware and, and dig out and look for things that we're not aware of to help us in our own development and growth. Very good. Thank you, Gwen. Um, and, and kind of to key off a little bit about what Gwen had, Gwen had just stated and what Francis had stated regarding our young people and the education, uh, it kind of frustrates me a little bit. And as a school administrator and having a staff and February rolls around and the staff typically, and this happens to in schools throughout the country, what do they do? They go to the cupboard. They go to the cupboard and they pull out pictures of Martin Luther King and um, um, George Carver. Uh, those typical fond pictures, uh, not that they are not worthy of that attention, but there are so many more, such as James Lawson's, um, such as some of the others we're going to talk about this morning, um, that if educators made themselves more aware, and if we as adults made ourselves more aware and more well-rounded regarding the rich cultures uh, around us and, and the contributions that many of people of different cultures and different categories have, have given to us, then we could better educate our students regarding those. And um, we have so much at, at hand in regards to YouTube, in regards to Google, in regards to a number of things that we can better inform ourselves, thereby being better informed, are better informing, and are behaving in a manner that is succinct with our teachers, uh, talking about nonviolence, talking about how to get things done in a socially appropriate manner. So um, I think, and what you said, Gwen, I think it behooves us to seek the truth beyond the surface and seek information beyond what is uh, just the surface. So thank you. I'm gonna 
make an attempt to move on without starting this video again. Which I'm not having to say that's again. You might try clicking the down arrow twice, Vince. I think the mic at the bottom is um, off. Yeah, I did on the video because I don't want it blasting when I'm trying to get to the uh, next slide. And I'm clicking the down arrow multiple times. Is it working for you, Glenn? Um, yeah, try clicking outside of the video. Um, there you go. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Good. We, we let's let's proceed. So um, I think all of us know uh, who this is and why. You know, we want to clarify. You know, this is obviously it's Rosa Parks, 1955. Uh, Rosa Parks worked. Um, she was a clerical worker for the NAACP. And this was not intentional, was not planned. Although the NAACP at that time had been talking and trying to find out how to respond to the bias treatment that was going on regarding bus riding for the African-American uh, population. Meaning, if people are not aware, is that where Rosa Parks is sitting right now is not okay unless the bus is empty. And I, I may be, I may be the, the oldest person on the, on the, on, online here today, but I do recall that. Uh, when I was in elementary school, my mother worked downtown. Uh, she worked at the downtown YMCA. And our directions, not necessarily to go to an empty nest at home, our directions were to walk across the street uh, where the bus stop was, uh, wait for the bus, get on the bus, and the bus stop went, went uh, downtown, and the bus stopped one block from the YMCA. And between the YMCA and the bus stop was the public library. We had permission to go there uh, after school, if you like, or you, we are to go straight to my mother's office uh, at the Y and report in, um, and then do whatever she says after that. So I do remember um, exactly that bus, that time, and knowing that um, the back doors, we were to sit past further back than the back door. Uh, we were not to sit up front there. And um, so on this day, when Rosa Parks, Rosa Parks got on the bus, she says, I was just simply tired. I was simply tired. And I not only tired physically, we understand that, and that is clearly written in her writings and stated in her writings that I wasn't so much tired physically. I was so much tired mentally, emotionally by being oppressed, by being marginalized, by being less than, by treating uh, uh, as though I had no rights and no privileges. And so she sat down there. And we know the rest of the story that she was threatened. She was told that she would be arrested and she was arrested. Now, I want us to, to understand that Rosa Parks was not the first. Um, and if we study our history, we recognize that Rosa Parks situation was paramount because of not only who she was and also familiar with the NAACP office and them her that it became a bus boycott. It became a major issue. But even prior to her, there were 
several different circumstances where people sat down on the other area of the, un, in the un, un, uh, inappropriate area of the bus and refused to move and had gotten arrested. So we have the Rosa Parks thing, and then we began the bus boycott. At that time, the people in Montgomery and the South began to be aware of the teachings and the practices of nonviolence with Dr. Martin Luther King. And they elected him to lead the bus boycott. Now, as James Lawson had just stated, the official civil rights movement did not begin until after the bus boycott. And so you have the bus boycott and then you have the civil rights movement. And the bus boycott was kind of the, the prelim, if you will, and kind of kicked it off. But the boy, bus boycott was, uh, was, was led and directed and was by elected official, Dr. Martin Luther King at that time because the people involved in the bus boycott did not want this boycott to become a physical battle, a, 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 a war, if you will, where it became very violent. That was not the agenda at all. So thereby not choosing not to ask someone to lead their group that was going to uh, direct them towards a more violent, uh, hopefully a resolution to the, to the bus problem, but a more peaceful resolution to the bus problem. So as we know that, that uh, it lasted for quite some time, it lasted over a year. Uh, Martin did not believe that it would be initially, even after his speeches, did not believe it would be that successful. He did not believe that people would not, would choose not because that was their means, their only means of transportation to some of their jobs and getting around and so forth. Um, but it shows he woke up one morning and looked out his window and saw many, many, many people of color walking and people not of color supporting the bus got, but the bus boycott walking. And it got so detrimental to the businesses in that, at that time, not only the bus business, but the other businesses because people could not uh, get there and people were not riding the bus that uh, it was the city of Montgomery that chose to um, come to a conclusion and compromise regarding that boycott. And so that was, began the official uh, engagement and the civil rights movement where people began to recognize that the practice of nonviolence does have credibility and that we should continue to do that. Now, I want us to understand simultaneously when this, when this began, we also have an, a, a situation with Emmett Till. And I would share with you that Emmett Till was our um, uh, George Floyd of 1956. Uh, Emmett Till was a young man uh, down south who was accused of bumping into a Caucasian lady in the elevator. And um, she made a big deal of it, if you will, making a short version of it. Um, and it ended up that Emmett Till was killed. And uh, uh, he was beaten pretty severely, hung, drug, and beaten pretty severely to the point that his mother had decided to have a open casket funeral because she wanted the world to know. We did not have social media at that time where we were able to, to not able to, but people had the occasion to see, just like George Floyd, uh, real life action of what was going on to um, Negro Americans at that time. And, uh, but mother chose to have an, an open casket regarding her son. And it was very, very devastating. It was picked up by some of the papers and Time Magazine, very, very devastating to a lot of folks. Um, and it kind of kicked off, if you will, the, um, the boycott, uh, the, I mean, the, the civil rights movement in, in a number of different ways. Various things, King, King became very active regarding uh, the statement regarding civil, the statements about civil rights, what should we should do, uh, marches, protests, and so forth, to the point that um, after many, many phone threats and many, many threats to Dr. Martin Luther King, 
regarding his words and his behavior, what he had been doing, his home was blown, was, was blown up uh, through a bomb through his house. And it was obviously pretty well devastated. He, the family was still there. And fortunately, none of them were, were hurt. Now, another thing that really impressed me at that time regarding Martin Luther King and his movement is that a lot, a lot, a lot of people, in fact, almost everyone um, that was an advocate of nonviolence kind of flipped the switch, if you will, that if someone is trying to resolve a problem nonviolently and someone or a group of someone's um, is that violent and that aggressive regarding the movement, then violence should be taken towards that group. King sat on the porch or stood on the porch of this home that was recently bombed and told a mass of people gathered together and ready to follow him. If he said, if he said the, the least little thing regarding an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it's time to get them back, then they were ready to do that. They were armed and ready to do that. And King knew that. But instead, he stated that we must respond to the, these acts of horrible nonviolence with an act of, of kindness and love for our brothers and not engage in the same type of behavior that they did, but rise above that behavior. And um, impressed a number of us living and seeing and feeling what was happening at that time uh, to continue to support uh, Dr. King and the nonviolence movement. Uh, and a number of people at that time at that place that were ready to do whatever Dr. King had directed them to do. And having your house look like that and bombed uh, by people who hate you simply because they don't know you, but yet you're advocating love for them. Um, to me, that's also what is our church is all about in regards to forgiveness, in regards to what our theme is all about, in regards to the, the beloved and recognizing that although that has happened, that we are obligated to continue to love and continue to care for our brothers and sisters. Um, questions, thoughts thus far? Okay. Yeah, uh, I would. Yes, go ahead. I'm Gwen. sorry. <laughs> this is Gwen. Uh, I would just say that I, I noticed that uh, Vincent did not show the picture of Emmett Till, but I would suggest that some of you take the time to look up Emmett Till's name. It is a very brutalized picture. And to me, uh, and I remember when all of that happened, he was a 14 year old boy who was bludgeoned to death, uh, brutally killed. And it had, as uh, Vincent has indicated, had the impact during that day that the murder of George Floyd has had on our current society. Um, Emmett was an innocent young boy, but I think it what it did for the nation was bring uh, in in your face type view of the result of hatred and how innocence can be killed as a result of violence. So it was a turning point, I think, for many in the nation, not only Blacks, but white people as well. And I just needed to highlight that. Yeah, thank you, Gwen. I mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned innocent, innocent young boy because it was found out later, she was adamant about him touching her uh, intentionally or accidentally, whatever. And it was not until he was his death, his beating and his death and his burial that she came forth and said that he did nothing to her. He had not touched her at all, that she had created that story. Um, so that's, that, and that's true, Gwen, I chose not, and I do, I appreciate you encouraging people to go look at that yourself. I purposely did not show the open casket of Emmett Till in inside there and uh, him lying on a cot. Um, I did have an opportunity uh, about six months ago to, Washington, to go to Washington, D.C., and we went to the um, Black Museum, and they do have a very, very um, impactful display and story of Emmett Till and his mother and his family in, in those times. And it is very, very touching. And it, it was the George Foreman, um, uh, George Floyd 
case of the 1950s, 55s. Any other statements, questions or anything? Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Vince. I posted the uh, link to that photograph in the chat if anyone uh, wants to, to look at it later. It's very impactful, uh, as you said. Um, so thanks for that, Gwen, as well. Um, I, I guess uh, relating to back to Rosa Parks um, and the fact that this kind of happened spontaneously and it wasn't planned, um, how much interaction was there after that between uh, uh, Dr. King and Rosa Parks as a, a part of the movement. I mean, I know she she became an icon for the movement, uh, but uh, did they have a lot of, uh, um, uh, did she participate in the leadership of the civil rights movement as a woman or was that not, was that avenue not really available to her other than, you know, I, I'm just curious as to how that all developed, what their relationship was like. Sure, it was basically the NAACP who went seeking Dr. Martin Luther King and, uh, and then moved that he would be voted as chair of the civil rights movement. So Martin Luther King was the chair of the civil rights movement, but Rosa Parks was the face of the civil rights movement. And so they walked together, they, they did, in fact, there's a significant amount of pictures uh, during this time afterwards that they're, they, they're constantly in, in the frame together. Um, so she became very much a part of Dr. King's walk and work as much as she could. He traveled a lot. Um, and so she could not go all places, but as much as, as she could. So they were, they worked together quite a bit. May I add something, Vincent? Um, I do know that, as you said, her decision was moment, just happened at that moment. However, uh, Mrs. Parks had been through uh, what was called the Highlander Training School about uh, civil, I think it was about civil disobedience, but basically after the incident and she contacted the NAACP, they had been waiting on a case to bring uh, before the courts about uh, blacks on the buses. And hers was an ideal case because of her uh, standing in, in the community because of of the nature of what took place with her. So they chose to make her case, the case they would follow up on. So although she didn't refuse to get up for that reason, uh, they, the NAACP used her case. Yeah, thank you, Gwen. Any, any other comments? If not, I'm going to let people take about a 10 minute break. Um, according to my clock right now, it's 1015. And so if we can, we'll, we'll reconvene at 1030, 1025. 
Vince, I have 10.06. Um, yeah. So did you, you want us to come back at 10.15? Yes, yeah. Okay, so 10.15, thank you. Thank you. Vince, this is Gwen, just to let you know, this is really enjoyable and enlightening. I've learned some things here. I probably will not be able to stay the duration because of other commitments, but I will stay as long as I can. All right, well, thank you very much, Gwen. I appreciate you being here. You're welcome. And we are recording, so we'll make this available on the uh, Mission Center's uh, YouTube channel as well, Gwen, so that you can access anything that you may have missed. Just a FYI, there, uh, the lightning is starting here in the west side on the west side of the state, Council Bluffs. So I don't know how long it might take to roll that way if it's heading that way. But I know sometimes internet connectivity is oh. challenging <laughs> sometimes. So just a heads up. Thanks. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> oh. uh, it's it's not nothing's going on here now. It's kind of clear. So that's but it may yeah, hit us just, by the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, just starting to hear the lightning here now. Yeah, I don't know if, if Maryland's in Jefferson, I don't know if they're having anything there yet. She'd be our early warning uh, detection system. <laughs> this is Maryland in Jefferson. I don't trust my computer this morning. I'm having computer issues. At this time, nothing is happening in Jefferson. Oh, it's cloudy, out, it's cloudy outside, but there's no lightning or no rain at this point. Yeah. Well, that, that makes sense. I guess it's, cloud, it's cloudy here too. I kind of have my back to the window, but um, it's kind of a bright cloudy. So it almost looks like the sun is shining. <laughs> Are you getting rain, Francis, or just uh, lightning at this point? Sorry, took a second to unmute. Yes, rain. Yeah, looks like it will be the next three hours according to my uh, rain app. I was just getting ready to try and check the radar to see which way it was moving, see if it was gonna hit Lamona or not. Or I guess also Des Moines, right? Vince is in Des Moines. Yes, yeah, West Des Moines, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we'll maybe I'll talk faster. So make sure that we kind of get in with the the meat and potatoes before we have to the weather affects us. Oh, I'm sure it wouldn't be until after afternoon, probably. Radar looks like it can be a, it's, I mean, it looks like pretty much through Iowa and Nebraska, it's, it, but it's spotty hit and miss. So, um, so the answer is who knows? I was amazed when we were up at senior high camp that one night we had that big storm come over and uh, a couple of the counselors approached me and said, Do you, are you familiar with the evacuation procedures if we have to, you know, where we need to go and everything, if there's a tornado alert? I said, yes. And, and I, I watched the storm that night as it blew over because it, 
it was what around two in the morning or something like that i kept looking at my phone to see what was going on and it, the storm split into two and almost literally went around uh, guthrie uh so that we didn't really get the worst of it at all it was just really amazing Sometimes it'll do it around here. They call it the Oma Dome, Omaha Dome effect of weather. And it just goes around Omaha sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. I don't know whether it's real or uh, urban legend, but I hear people <laughs> talk about or read about it. Well, the, yeah, and there's also the, there's like the, uh, there's been very little history, if any, of tornadoes hitting Des Moines. So there's sort of a legend that, Des Moines is immune from tornadoes because of the intersection of the rivers or something like that. <laughs> yeah, they say that here in Council Bluffs too, but we had a river, uh, sorry, tornado in 88 and one of them even came across on the bridge. So, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah the river, I, they used to say the river would send, if it hit the river, it would send it back up. But um um, I retract my previous statement. I hadn't actually actually looked out. I was just looking at my app. So it's not raining yet. He, well, no, nope, I take it back again. Little spots on the windshield as I'm looking out, but the <laughs> rain app, the rain app sure said it was raining here, but yeah. just little sprinkles now, maybe. Yeah, on top of the lightning uh, here in West Des Moines, we have the problem of uh, the cable uh, fiber is being installed. And so they're, everything's torn up in the system right now. And you know, the, the crews are constantly knocking a wire or a cable or something loose and, and people are losing surface, all kinds of things. So it's, it's been uh, very, very questionable the last few weeks. especially the last week or so. There was actually a story on the news last night about that very situation. Oh, um, was there? Oh. Yes. And of course the, the lawns and so forth are, are uh, properly marked with all the flags indicating where the lines are, but um, they're still trying to install this new line. And they said, Sometimes they just have a very narrow space to work in. And so, yes, they are, are hitting the old wires and knocking things out of, um, um, knocking things off. And um, they're talking about the homeowners are so frustrated because many of them are still working from home and they're losing their uh, internet connections and, and TV and all of that. And sometimes up to 18 hours and, so it's been kind of a frustrating experience for a lot of folks, but um, I think it'll be nice when it's done. That would be my opinion in that situation. Wait till it's done and then, and then think about how much you really enjoy the, the high-speed internet, but it's kind of a pain getting there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it when it, when it really finally arrives because I think right now they're just installing like the, the conduit like the outer housing and then they have to actually run the fiber through the conduit later so we don't have the benefits of it yet <laughs> yeah. i don't know what the timeline is for that project when they expect it to be done but um it'll be nice when when it's completed yeah absolutely are you getting do you already have fiber in jefferson or is it planned do we have fiber Yes, we already have it. Yeah, I think we're we're late here. I think they have it in Lamoni too. I'm not sure though. Um, speaking of such, Glenn, as a. a you produce such wonderful content there in Lamoni, so I appreciate you opening it up for other folks um, to participate. But uh, I have noticed when the videos are embedded, I think, in your PowerPoint, 
um, more recently, I don't think I remember this from last year uh, reunion, but well, me, no, uh -uh. but they're choppy um, sometimes, or like uh, the one that Vince showed this morning also uh, was kind of choppy <clears throat> versus, I guess someone told me if you just play them from like YouTube themselves, although then it's not as crisp and clean visually, uh, the play speed might be better because I don't have any trouble with what I'm seeing from you via Zoom, but like uh, the little uh, funny home videos were just real choppy or other things. So just some feedback as a viewer uh, on the site. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, we're like, so I'm really, I can't wait until we get the high speed here. Uh, that will help a lot. Um, we, the, what the videos we're watching this morning with Vince are playing straight from YouTube. They're not, they're not embedded in the PowerPoint. So we're watching a connection to YouTube, not an oh. actual embedded okay. file. Oh, it's well, in the, it's in the frame of the slide, but it's 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 speeding straight from YouTube and Vince's. Now, my, all of mine that you referred to from last week were actual, you know, playing off of my hard drive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know then why, but they they were choppy, and I and I don't remember that so much from last year at reunion. But yeah, well, anyway. last weekend, as I said, the connections were probably at the all-time worst it was just really really bad last weekend i see gotcha and okay especially okay. on saturday i think it was friday and saturday yeah. ah okay i got you now thank you uh pins if you're there i think we're probably ready okay all right so Another picture of uh, Dr. King and, and his idol, um, um, Gandhi. Now, it was during this time, basically in 1958, that Dr. King wrote his first book. Um, and it's really interesting that uh, during his promoting of the book in Harlem, um, a lady approached him and said, are you Dr. King? Are you Martin Luther King? And he said yes, and she stabbed him in his chest. And obviously uh, went to the hospital and uh, major surgery in a hurry and was told that the doctor said that the uh, blade was just uh, a fraction, fractions of an inch from his heart. And had he even sneezed during that time uh, before they removed that blade, uh, he would have not have lived and he would have perished. And um, so it was an interesting story, an interesting experience. Um, and just as an FYI, because people would immediately assume that it was a non-minority person who stabbed him because of his, of his views and of his um, demanding of rights for minority folks. But the fact of the matter is it was a mentally disturbed minority lady that, that stabbed him. Uh, but as we know, fortunately, he recovered from that. And not only did he recover from that, but it seemed to have given him more uh, energy and desire to do about, be, go about his work in, in nonviolence and making a change in, in protest. Um, he, uh, in, in 1959, after he recovered, this is where he's going to India with Claretta his wife and, and continuing to study. About at the same time, he uh, resigns as pastor of, of uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church or Ebenezer Church and, and no, he resigns from Dexter and he goes to Ebenezer back home and begins pastoring his father's church um, and still maintain that even in his travels um, to not only to India, but in his travels regarding nonviolent protest. And um, um, he became a far more active and gave some of his key speeches at that time uh, regarding the protest and drawing quite, quite a crowd 
uh, the radios and TVs began finding the value in what he was stating and supporting what he is stating and giving him uh, ample attention. Uh, and as some of you may or may not know, there was a sector of the government um, and and the reality is the the um, the um, key the chair of the FBI, who believed, and other elected officials who believed that, or labeled uh, Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King as a communist, they believed that he was stirring up people to be anti-government, anti what was going on at that time, which he is, which he was because what needed to be changed was government. What needed to be changed was some laws and some rights. What a population really wanted is everything to remain the same. That um, the Negro people should not be allowed to vote. They should not be allowed to have equal salary. They should not be able to live outside of poverty. They should not be able to do a variety of different things and, and segregation needed to be uh, prominent. And um, so because of that, there was a sector of the government that put together a campaign against him, uh, even life-threatening campaign coming from the sector of the government. Um, and we'll maybe talk about that a little bit later. I've got a video to show you regarding that. But it's important to know that he continued not only did he continue, although he had strong pushback from official people, but he began to sit in and protest and organize protests themselves. And this protest here was organized by Dr. Lawson um, and one of the first protests at Wool Woolworth's uh, eating counter. Um, and some of you may be aware of Woolworth's, Woolworth's store. Um, it was a store that had everything. It was a kind of a drugstore, uh, had, cl had clothing, had even had furniture in the store, and a small part of the store was a sit-in eating counter. However, uh, African-American folks and Negro folks at that time could go in and buy clothing and go in and buy other items from the store, but you could not eat at the counter. And so this protest, this particular one, was to show that we can and try to get the rights to eat at the counter and just as sitting on the bus and would not be moved. Um, and a number of people throughout the country put themselves in this position. And you can see right here the position that they put themselves in. They've sat in the counter and they were trained and there's videos on YouTube to look at that as well and it's sickening, but there's videos on YouTube to look at it where they were trained how to take a punch, how to not get upset when people are throwing, dumping things over your head, people are calling you names, people are spitting on you, people are doing every horrible thing possible to you, how not to react violently, a passive resistance protest. And um, as we see here at the counter is uh, our, our young people who put themselves out there to go through this horrific experience um, because they believe in the rights that people are due, that it's the civil rights that are granted. They believe in the training of Dr. Martin Luther King. They believe in the thoughts and the words in regards to, in spite of how the enemy or how the others behave, we must love and we must show compassion. We must not rise up and be as violent as they are, and meet violence with violence, that love prevails. And a number of people uh, put themselves in the position to stand up for the human rights, which many of us have the opportunity to enjoy today. Again, a number of different uh, marches went on that began a large number of, of marches everywhere. Um, that there in, in the overcoat there, on the ground on his knees is Dr. or Congressman John Lewis. Uh, and he talked about that a little bit in what you just saw. Um, this is in Birmingham. And again, things going on in Birmingham. Uh, again, sitting at the counter and again, in the middle there is John Lewis 
sitting in the counter and being allowing himself to be physically attacked and physically beaten while sim simply sitting and trying to establish the civil rights which you are granted by way of the Constitution. Now, this person is um, Edna Griffith. Now, uh, the point here is I want us to understand that the sit-ins at Woolworths, the, the protest, the, um, uh, I don't want to use the word riots, but the violent protests where people were attacked were not only occurring down south. Simultaneously, they were occurring various places in the country, just as all of us have lived through the George Floyd situation. And we hopefully, at watching the news, are aware that the protests regarding what was going on and what went on with George Floyd did not only happen in, this, in Minneapolis where, where this occurred, but it happened in other, on almost every state and in, in, in a lot of other countries as well. So we need to understand that throughout the United States, there were ongoing protests regarding civil rights, regarding just treatment. Um, and Edna Griffith here was one of the first, and she's, she kind of led the charge, uh, and there was ladies. I know two other ladies that are still alive yet that, was with, that were with her that sat in at Woolworths Counter here in downtown Des Moines um, and um, uh, protested the treatment and protested the, the, the refusal to serve and protested a number of things multiple times. Um, and I, I have special relationship with the Griffith and, and the Griffith and her, her movement. Um, and at that time took part in what I could take part in. Uh, my mother was a little, little resistant of me taking part in some of those protests. Um, but in what I could take part in, um, my mother, Edna Griffin's husband was a doctor and, in town and probably one of three African-American doctors in town. Uh, he had just opened a business, uh, an office. My mother was his secretary. And Ed, uh, Dr. Griffin, Stanley Griffin, shared the office with Robert Wright, who was a, one of the few lawyers in town. He originally was a police officer. Uh, he went to law school while being a police officer. He became a lawyer, opened practice. My mother was a secretary for Dr. Griffith and Robert Wright at the same time. Um, and Robert Wright went on to become the president of NAACP Iowa and the NAACP Northwest region. And um, so, and strangely enough, Edna Griffith, Sandy Griffith, her husband, Dr. Griffith, uh, my first prom date in high school was with their daughter, Linda Griffith. So there is a ongoing family contact, but the most important part to me is the stance that Edna had taken, risking her life and her well-being and her name and a number of other things to sit in at, 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 um, at uh, the drugstore Woolworths uh, counter for our civil rights. Simultaneously, uh, and I told others in another story that I wrote is that um, uh, when, when the march happened and over the bridge and the beating that we just saw earlier that same, the, the uh, African-American alliances in the churches informed the African-American churches throughout the nation and to support that going on in Montgomery by having their own marches in their own city. Uh, I was not engaged in a church at that time, but I was aware that a march was going to occur because not only the church, the churches were to promote it, but the community was to support it. And I became aware of it, there was going to be a march from the capital of, De of Iowa and, and Des Moines uh, down to uh, the Woolworths store. Um, and those that are familiar with Iowa or familiar with Des Moines knows, know that as you, the, the east side of Des Moines is the, the uh, downtown Des Moines is separated from the west side by a bridge, a river bridge, very similar to Birmingham, uh, to Montgomery. And, um, and so 
um, very similar to Montgomery on the other side, the west side of the bridge um, were the Des Moines police in force. And at that time, um, and I cannot tell you the name, of course I wouldn't tell you if I, <coughs> excuse me, if I found it, but um, a police chief that was not unlike uh, Chief O'Connor that was in the uh, South at that time, causing in Montgomery, causing great chaos and the very, very uh, violent and, and anti um, rights for uh, Negroes at that time. And so we had the march at the same time and pretty much the same thing happened in Des Moines as happened during that march where we were, the group was severely attacked um, and arrested and beat. Um, so just please know that on um, the civil rights movement, it cannot be an isolated thing where it happened and was not an isolated thing where it happened with just a few people in a few places. Um, I believe that it came, became impactful and became significant in our times and calling for sig significant changes because it was universal. It was throughout the United States. Uh, there were a significant number of people fighting for those rights uh, and not all of them. And we need to understand and kind of inform people of this. Not all of them were people of color that there were the majority of population who also felt and knew what was going on was wrong and it's time to change some things. It's time to grant people their civil liberties that is stated so clearly in our legal documents. Okay, so I'm gonna be quiet for a little bit because what we have next in talking about the protest is that Dr. Martin Luther King uh, was arrested and went to the Birmingham jail. And uh, we have the letter um, that he wrote uh, from the Birmingham jail. And I had asked those that pre-registered, do you receive a copy of a summary because the actual is very long and a summary of the letter from the Birmingham jail. I'd like for us to talk about that a little bit. And there are some questions there that I'd like for you to consider responding to. Uh, I don't think, I don't know no one person or no group, no is it required to go through the whole list, but there are some questions there. I would like to hear your feedback, your thoughts uh, regarding the letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, why was King arrested? Uh, what was the purpose of, the, of writing the letter? Uh, why did, what did he say about church's involvement in the civil rights movement? And what was the main message, the goal of the letter? And anything else that you would like to share uh, from the letter from Birmingham jail, okay? Again, we're gonna open the mic and you can un un unmute yourself and please feel free to share. Yeah, Vince, for me, I think one of the interesting things in the letter was, the, uh, uh, you know, who it was addressed to being addressed to religious leaders. Um, and the fact that um, Dr. King kind of called them out for uh, having criticized him, but not criticized the underlying uh, um, segregation and racism that was taking place in the community and the actions of the police in enforcing that. So the, the church was kind of called to task. But um, one of the things that he said um, in, in that, I think was very, relevant today because it it probably connects with the way a lot of people are thinking not so much inside the church but those that are outside the church he asked the question is organized religion too inextricably bound to the status quo to save our nation and the world and perhaps i must turn my faith to the inner spiritual church the church within the church as the true ecclesia and the hope of the world. And um, I, I found that statement, that quote from the letter really um, impactful and interesting uh, in, in a world today where we hear so much about the trends of postmodernism and their impact on the church and the fact that so many people are 
attracted to spirituality, but but less so to organized religion. And and um, we see the roots of that in the church's failure in many cases across the South, but really across uh, um, all of uh, uh, American society at the time to to choose clearly and directly choose the cause of justice and align themselves early on with the cause of justice. So given that, I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective in Community of Christ, how have we, um, how have we done um, in, in the time period of, of the civil rights movement and since in aligning ourselves with um, with the cause of justice, has the has the ecclesia of the church um, uh, been true to the spiritual church and its call? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question, Glenn. Um, thank you for that question. Let me spend some time elaborating on that. And while I'm doing that, I'd like for other people online here to uh, think of anything you'd like to respond to in regards to the letter from Birmingham. To, to questions you may have regarding that or statements, something that impact you by that or responding to any of the questions that we have on the board here. So um, uh, first of all, I would state this, that at the beginning when I talked about people sharing some quotes from Dr. King that most impacted or resonates with them. And I would say for me, there are different quotes depending on where I am in my life that those quotes resonate in a time in my life when I was, um, again, reading Dr. Martin Luther King, but I was not, um, I was struggling in regards to my place, in regards to what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it, when I wanted to do it, and with who, and, and all of that, struggling a lot. And the quote that I held on to at that time was in regards to, if you're going to, and summarizing, of course, if you're going to be a street cleaner, be the best darn street cleaner that, that God has ever seen. And whatever you're going to be, just do the best whatever you're going to do at that. And that stuck with me a lot of the time. However, most recently, with the George Floyd um, uh, incident, um, uh, what resonated with me and it kept popping in my head is the quote he made, made in regards to, at the end, what is going to astonish you and disappoint you the most is not the behavior of your enemies, because that is to be expected. It is the silence of your friends. Um, that will that will astonish and set you back the most, and that is what's resonated with me because um, that is key to what you had just asked in regards to my view of where the church is and where the bent where it has been. I believe that most, especially most recently, um, I would say especially most recently in the 21st century, the church has put a lot of energy, motivation, uh, articulation. Um, planning um, duties uh, into um, bringing forth the enduring principles, sharing the worth and the value of all people. I believe that we as an as affiliation um, are making a really great effort to do that. We have great writings and great statements that are very welcoming and accepting and, and um, encouraging about that. However, <clears throat> I believe that we as a people in our local congregations, in our local communities and so forth, are struggling to adopt and practice. Um, I believe that there are many who are aware of the words, aware of the philosophy, aware of the desire of the church to show our welcoming, to show our love for all people to show that we are a, a body of believers who believe that everyone, that all God's children have values. Um, it's, it's just that I, <clears throat> I've witnessed that there is a significant, significant number of our uh, people who uh, have, are not there yet to the part of practicing that and owning that and standing and demonstrating that on a regular basis. I believe that we are coming along. I believe that people still, on the most part, still have a desire to learn, but I believe there's a significant number who desire old school and um, don't necessarily desire to learn or desire to change. Um, so that's my, my current philosophy regarding that. 
Anyone else? Uh, this is Gwen. I would echo uh, what Vincent has shared um, very well. Over the years, I have seen the church be more pronounced in its statements with regard to um, inclusiveness. My dad back in, uh, was a pastor for 20 years of a congregation, um, a small mission in which I grew up in Florida. And we were separate from the white branch. And my dad challenged the church to be more forthright in its efforts to bring people together rather than adhering to the laws of the land. Uh, from an article he wrote back in 1961, I have it in front of me, I'll just read a quick excerpt. Some say, but we have state laws that require segregation. And my dad said, that's not true, except perhaps in South Africa. These state laws are only permissive at their strongest, and they certainly don't require segregation in houses of worship. Here in Pensacola, Florida, such churches as the Episcopal Church continue to seat worshipers regardless of race. And I feel that our church should be leading the way. He uh, went on to say that I believe the bringing forth of the church was for such a time as this. There are problems, there have always been problems, but this one, this challenge to develop racial harmony is one of the world's most acute. And he, uh, he believes the church has a place, a uh, role to play, it's, it's oil on troubled waters. Uh, it is an instrument of peace and it, as it is a battering ram against the gates of hell. It is a revelation in us of God's heaven on earth. So my dad followed up with that article, uh, standing up at conferences. I remember when I was a child introducing uh, legislation that would allow the church, enable the church to say we stand for brotherhood, and I would add in sisterhood, of all humankind. Um, as I have served on a variety of teams looking at race relations, ethnicity, all of that, again, I do believe the church is more forthright in articulating its beliefs, uh, more clear in upholding the worth of all persons. But as Vince said, um, the true witness of that comes when congregations um, act in accordance with that and are engaged not only in welcoming, but engaged in standing up for justice, whether that's through your ballot that you vote for in elections or who you engage with uh, on a personal level. So um, I see us moving in the right direction and my hope continues that each of us uh, become more aware of how we can be a part of bringing people together. Thank you, Gwen. One other, one other person. Oh, this is Penny. Yes, can you Penny. hear me? Yes, Penny. Oh, yes, I, I was I read the letter and I was uh, uh, reading it and kind of had to uh, stop and, and, you know, reread things again. But it just pointed out how unfair it's been over all these years, the, the inequality, the, uh, the justice. Uh, and they looked at them when they went in there, the clergy looked at them as uh, outsiders and as outsiders and they uh, started trouble and we're gonna bring violence and it's kind of that kind of stuck out to me. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much, Penny. All right, um, those that have not shared it, I'd like to show you another video script. And um, this is an interview um, with Dr. King from I believe it's Dan Wallace. Um, very informative and lightning, asking good questions. I really would like to hear your responses to Dr. King's response to the question from uh, this reporter. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts. 
and especially the applicability of it in the 21st century, where we are right now. Uh, what's going on? Has those 50 years plus you know, later, where are we with this? Civil Rights, King, Van Oker, Roll 20, Sound 36. Dr. King, this church is as good a place as any to go back over your commitment to the civil rights movement. When you went out from here into university and then you went to Montgomery, Alabama and started the bus boycotts there, what was the philosophy of the civil rights movement as you saw it then, more than 10 years ago? Well, I would say then the philosophy was that we must go all out to use legal and nonviolent methods to gain full citizenship rights uh, for the Negro people of our country. Now, of course, uh, that particular struggle and that philosophy centered on breaking down all of the barriers of legal segregation. So I would say that in that period, uh, the basic thrust for the gaining of citizenship rights for Negroes uh, was to end uh, the humiliation surrounding the whole system of legal segregation. Dr. King, was there something peculiar to the place where you started and the kind of people you attracted? I mean by that, there was a strong attachment on the part of your parishioners in Montgomery to the church. They were older people, weren't they? Yes, I would say by and large they were older people who uh, participated in the boycott because they were the ones using the bus, bus more than anybody else. And uh, Montgomery was a community predominantly church senate. Uh, so that uh, it was very easy to get to the vast majority of Negroes because they were in some way connected with a church in the community. Sir, in addition to your commitment to the idea of nonviolence, wasn't it also the only thing you could do, the white community having the monopoly on violence, that if you had tried violence, they would have met it with violence? It was the only device open to you, wasn't it? Well, I'll put it another way, that uh, <clears throat> morally, I was led to nonviolence because I felt that it was the best moral way to deal with the problem. We were seeking to establish a just society. And uh, it was my feeling then, and it is my feeling now, that uh, violence is certainly much more uh, socially destructive and it creates many more social problems than it solves. So I was led to nonviolence for deep moral reasons. Now there is no doubt about the fact that in our struggle in Montgomery and all over the United States for that matter, nonviolence is also practically sound. Uh, it would just be impractical for the Negro to turn to violence. He has neither the instruments nor the techniques of violence. We are about 10 or 11 percent of the total population of the nation, and I would say we are about one tenths or one percent of the firepower. So it would just be totally impractical and unwise and unrealistic for the Negro to think of violence. Well, I saw this in the beginning in uh, Montgomery, but this wasn't the basic reason that I uh, turned to nonviolence and that I believed in it as a philosophy. I turned to it because I felt that it was the morally excellent way to deal with the problem of racial injustice in our country. Is there something about nonviolence that made it, and I use that in the past tense, that made it more useful among Southern Negroes than the ghetto Negroes of the North? I wouldn't say there's uh, anything that makes it more useful to uh, Southern Negroes. I think it is true that uh, we've had more nonviolent movements in the South because 
Uh, the problem for many years was more crystallized and, in a sense, more visible in the South. Uh, we didn't have many civil rights activities on a massive scale in the North until three or four years ago. So I would say that uh, we just haven't had a chance to experiment on a broad scale with nonviolence in the northern ghetto. I have the feeling that nonviolence is as applicable uh, and workable in the northern ghetto as it is uh, in the south. Now, there's a larger job there. Uh, the frustrations at points are much deeper. The bitterness is deeper. And I think that's because in the South, we can see pockets of progress here and there. We've really made some strides that are very visible, and every Southern Negro knows that he can do things today that he couldn't do four or five years ago. Where in the North, uh, the Negro sees only retrogress, uh, and he doesn't find it as easy to get his vision centered on his target, the target of opposition, as he does in the South. Consequently, this is made for despair and at many points cynicism, a feeling that you can't win. And it simply means that we've got to develop in the North a massive job of organization and mobilizing forces and resources to deal with the problem in the urban ghettos of the North, just as we've done it in the South. Well, in the South, particularly in Alabama, you had visible villains, Jim Clark, Bull Connor, cattle prods, police dogs. But in the North, you don't have those visible villains. Isn't it hard to get your people aroused and directed at something that isn't visible? Well, that's exactly right. And this is what I was saying when I said it's harder to see a target. Uh, in the South, in the nonviolent movement, we were aided always on the whole by the brutality of our opponent. Uh, it isn't the same way in the uh, north. The other thing is that you don't have legal segregation uh, in the north as you do in the south. So it is much more difficult to get people to see exactly what you're doing, but uh, it isn't an impossible job. It's, uh, it's a hard, it's a tedious job at times to get people to be aroused from their apathetic slumbers, but I still feel that uh, Negroes in the North can be motivated just as they were motivated in the South. And I think as time goes on with the growing economic deprivation in the Negro community, it will even be easier because people will come to see that not only is something wrong in general, but something is wrong in particular in their own economic and housing situation. Well, what is it? I mean, how do you find it? Uh, it's very subtle in the North, is it not? It's subtle, but it's uh, becoming much more visible. Uh, it, uh, anybody can see that the schools are more segregated in the North today than they were in 1954 when the Supreme Court rendered its decision declaring segregation unconstitutional. Anybody can look around the ghetto and see that ghetto schools are predominantly segregated and devoid of quality. Anyone who moves through a major ghetto of our country will see the housing conditions. Uh, people don't have to be reminded that they are forced to live in slums in many instances, and they're often rat-infested, vermin-filled slums. And it isn't too hard to see the exploitation that the Negro confronts in the ghetto, where he is forced to pay uh, more for less and constantly trying to make ends meet, but because of either no job as a result of unemployment, uh, a job that is so uh, economically unprofitable that the person can't make ends meet. And I think they see all of these things, and more and more they are coming to see them, because before the people of the North were looking to the South, and they supported the struggles of the South. Now they are coming to see that their problems are very real, and they've got organized to grapple with them. Was there something hypocritical about the fact that the South existed and the North could point the finger? And then when the Civil Rights Acts were passed in the early 60s, you couldn't point the finger anymore? Well, there was no doubt about the hypocrisy of uh, large segments of the nation on the whole question of, of racial equality. I think the best example is that many of the senators 
from the North and the West and congressmen generally who voted for civil rights legislation in 64 and even 65 of the Voting Rights Bill refused last year to vote for civil rights legislation because it dealt with an issue applicable to the North, the whole housing question. And uh, this, it seems to me, was the greatest expression of the hypocrisy of uh, many of our citizens and many of the senators and congressmen of the North. But isn't that part of the dilemma now? That people knew that Negroes were being, being denied what was guaranteed to them by the Constitution, by the fact that they were citizens of this country. Then when they were given those rights, do you feel the white community said, well, we've given them all that we have, now it's up to them? Well, I think the dilemma is much deeper, and I think uh, one during this period of transition has to be very honest with America. And honesty impels me to admit that America has uh, broad racist elements still alive. Racism is still uh, existing in American society in many areas of the society, North and South. And the other thing is that there has never been a single, solid, determined commitment of large segments of white America on the whole question of racial equality. Uh, I think we have to see that vacillation has always existed, ambivalence has always existed, and this to me is the so-called white backlash. It's merely a new name for an old phenomenon. I see the white backlash as a continuation of the same ambivalence and vacillation of white America on the whole question of racial justice that ex has existed uh, since the founding of our nation. I think the other thing that uh, we must see at this time is that many of the people who supported us in Selma, in Birmingham, were really outraged about the extremist behavior toward Negroes. But they were not at that moment, and they are not now, committed to genuine equality for Negroes. It's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee an annual income, for instance, to get rid of poverty for Negroes and all poor people. It's much easier to integrate a bus uh, than it is to make genuine integration a reality and quality education a reality in our schools. It's much easier to integrate even a public park than it is to get rid of slums. And I think we are in a new era, a new phase of the struggle, where we have moved from a struggle for decency, which characterized our struggle for 10 or 12 years, to a struggle for genuine equality. And this is where we are getting the resistance because there was never any intention uh, to go this far. People were reacting to Bull Connor and to Jim Clark rather than acting in good faith for the realization of genuine equality. Do you think white people in this country, and I'm talking about non-segregation, as people devoid or thinking they're devoid of racism, do you have any idea of what they want the Negro to be in America? Well, it depends on the level that we are talking here, uh, because I think you have to make a distinction between the people who are genuinely and absolutely committed in the white community on the question of, of racial equality. And I must confess that I think they are in a very small minority. I think the vast majority of white Americans uh, will go but so far. It's a kind of installment plan for equality, and uh, they are always looking for an excuse uh, to go, but so far. Why are they looking for the excuse? What is it about the Negro? I mean, every other group that came as an immigrant, somehow, not easily, but somehow got around it. Is it just the fact that Negroes are black? That's a part of it, and growing, that grows out of something else. You can't thingify anything without depersonalizing that something. If you use something as a means to an end, at that moment you make it a thing and you depersonalize it. The fact is that the Negro was a slave in this country for 244 years. That act, uh, that was 
uh, a willful thing that was done. The Negro was brought here in chains, treated in very inhuman fashion. And this led to the thingification of the Negro. So he was not looked upon as a person. He was not looked upon as a human being with the same uh, status and worth as other human beings. And the other thing is that human beings cannot continue to do wrong without eventually uh, rationalizing that wrong. So slavery was justified morally, biologically, uh, theoretically, scientifically, everything else. And it seems to me that white America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. Uh, that is one thing that other immigrant groups haven't had to face. The other thing is that the color became a stigma. American society made the Negroes' color a stigma. And uh, that can never be uh, overlooked. So I think these things are absolutely necessary. The other thing is that America freed the slaves in 19, I mean 1863 through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality, and as a matter of fact, to, to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate. And therefore, it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, oh, they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. But uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all of these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. Apart from wanting to live better, which all of us want to do, to raise one's children in a better way, to be better, does the Negro in America know what he wants to be? I'm convinced that uh, almost every Negro in this country, other than those who have been so scarred by the system that they've become pathological in the process, and we all have to battle with pathology. Nobody really knows what it means uh, to be a Negro unless one can really experience it. And I know we all have to battle with this constant drain of uh, a feeling of nobodiness. But in spite of this, uh, I think the vast majority of Negroes in this country know that they want to be people. They want to be men. They want equality, period. It just boils down to that. And we haven't been able to be people. We haven't been men because of all of the uh, conditions that we've lived with and the syndrome of deprivation surrounding conditions, whether it's in housing or in the economic area or in schools or in the vicious credit practices that we face in the ghetto and all of the problems of closed doors and constant defeats. But uh, in spite of all this, I think we all know, uh, basically, that we want to be men. We want to be persons judged not on the basis of the color of our skin, but on the basis of the content of our character. But you know that many young Negroes don't want anything that smacks of the American white middle class. But do they want something that smacks of whatever is the black middle class, or do they just not want bourgeois values, which after all are the basis of this democracy? Well, I think uh, we have to see what they are saying. Uh, I would be the first to agree that uh, integration does not mean giving up everything that has an Afro-American taint, so to speak, our background. I think there are certain unique 
things within any culture and certain cultural patterns that when you get to the process of amalgamation can really lift the whole culture. And it seems to me that integration at its best is the opportunity to participate in the beauty of diversity. I think the other thing that we've got to see is that these young people are saying that there must be a revolution of values in our country. As Jimmy Baldwin said on one occasion, what advantage is there in being integrated into a burning house? And I feel that uh, there is a need for a revolution of values in America because some of the values that presently exist are certainly out of line with the uh, values and the idealistic structure uh, that brought our nation into being. Unfortunately, we haven't been true to these ideals, and many of the values of uh, so-called white middle-class society are values uh, that need to be reviewed and uh, re-evaluated, and in a real sense, they need to be changed. So I think the young people in the Negro community who are raising these questions are raising some very profound questions about our total society. In other words, they are saying that there must be a restructuring of the architecture uh, of our society where values are concerned. And with this, I would agree with. So in the quest for integration, I think we can offer our whole nation something because there are three evils in our nation. It's not only racism, but economic exploitation of poverty would be one, and then militarism. And I think in a sense, and in a very real sense, these three are tied inextricably together, and we aren't going to get rid of one without getting rid of the other. Well, you stood on the Lincoln Memorial <laughs> that day in August, 63, and you said, I had a dream. Did that dream envision that you could see a war in Asia, preventing the federal government doing for the Negroes, preventing the society doing for the Negroes, that which you think had to be done? No, I didn't envision that then. I must confess that that period was a great period of hope for me. And uh, I'm sure for many others all across the nation, many of, of the Negroes who had about lost hope saw a solid decade of progress in the South. And uh, in 1954, which was, uh, I mean, 64, 1963, nine years after the Supreme Court's decision to be in the March on Washington, meant a great deal. It was a high moment, a great watershed moment. But I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. Now, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. Uh, I still have faith in the future. But I've had to analyze many things over the last few years, and I would say over the last few months. I've gone through a lot of soul searching and agonizing moments, and I've come to see that uh, we have uh, many more difficult days ahead, and some of the old optimism was a little superficial, and now it must be tempered with a solid realism. And I think the realistic fact is that we still have a long, long way to go, and that we are involved in a war on Asian soil, uh, which, if not checked and stopped, can poison the very soul of our nation. Dr. King, even if there had not been a war in Asia, would you still not have had this nightmare insofar as the Negro movement for equality then touched on two things that the white community holds sacred, their children and their property? Oh, I have no doubt that we would have encountered great difficulties, great problems of resistance if the war had not uh, been in existence, so that I'm not going to say that all of our problems would be solved if the war in Vietnam is ended. But I do say that the war makes it infinitely more difficult to deal with these problems. Uh, when a nation becomes obsessed with the guns of war, uh, it loses its social perspective and programs of social uplift suffer. This is just a, a fact of history so that 
we do face many more difficulties uh, as a result of the war. It's much more difficult to really arouse a conscience during a time of war. I noticed the other day, some weeks ago, a Negro was shot down in Chicago, and it was a clear case of police brutality. That was on page 30 of the paper, but on page 1 at the top, was 780 Viet Cong killed. That is something about a war like this that makes people insensitive. It dulls the conscience. It strengthens the forces of reaction. And it brings into being bitterness and hatred and violence. And it strengthened the military industrial complex of our country. And it's made our job much more difficult because I think we can go along with some programs if we didn't have this war on our hands that would cause people to adjust to new developments, just as they did in the South. They said they'd never ride the bus with us. Blood would flow in the streets. They wouldn't go to school and all of these things. But when people came to see that they had to do it because the law insisted, they finally adjusted. And I think white people all over this country will adjust once the nation makes it clear that in schools, in housing, We've got to learn to live together as brothers. I think the biggest problem now is that we got our gains over the last 12 years at bargain rate, so to speak. It uh, didn't cost the nation anything. In fact, it helped the economic side of the nation to integrate lunch counters and public accommodations. It didn't cost the nation anything uh, to get uh, the right to vote established. And now we are confronting issues that cannot be solved without costing the nation billions of dollars. Now, I think this is where we're getting our greatest resistance. They may put it on many other things, but we can't get rid of slums and poverty without it costing the nation something. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our... Okay, so now's your time. Share with us a little bit your thoughts regarding this interview with Dr. King. Rather lengthy, a lot of information there. What are your thoughts? Anything? Questions? I think quite a bit of this was included in the movie Salem, or at least it, it seemed to trigger in me some familiarity with at least part of it through that movie. So some of the message got out um, through that movie. Uh, it did, great, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you saw the movie. Yeah, you remember that, yes. Thank you, anyone else? I was just struck again by his poise and mindfulness, even in the face of some cringeworthy questions. And uh, he was just masterful in his answers and so focused on, on his mission. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Okay, what we're going to talk about briefly is the Freedom Writers. So basically in 1961, uh, a group of Freedom Writers organized himself uh, to leave from Washington, D.C. to go down south to continue to uh, fight for passively the rights for all. Um, and recognized that um, a lot of segregation was going on, and it was not good. It was not fair. It was not equal. It was not just, and it needed to be changed. The thing that I want to emphasize, too, that I have over the years is because a lot of people believe that the movement was an African-American people or Negroes movement, and that was all that needed to be involved and have been involved. And I suggest to people 
that when you look at any of the tapes, any of the pictures, any of the news articles or whatever regarding the struggle and the protests, the, the uh, violent reaction that the protesters got and they knew it, they were going to get that. We look at those, they speak for themselves in that this battle cannot be won solely by the oppressed population. This battle cannot be won uh, with by just the Negro or the African American people. That and it was not fought by just the African American people. That a number, hence our theme for today, our beloved community. We are a beloved community. Martin Luther King stressed the beloved community, calling upon all brothers and sisters to pull together to make a change regarding segregation. And um, you can see here as an example, these are the folks on the freedom ride on the, on the bus, the bus that went from Washington down, uh, down south. And I would encourage you, and I did not purposely put these in this, in this slide presentation, but I would encourage you to go on YouTube um, or even Google it and then go to images and look at some of the images as to how these folks were treated in, in standing up for what has been wrong, standing up for those that have been marginalized, standing up for those who have been given, have been silenced, the voices that have been taken away, the rights have been taken away, and knowing that that was wrong and doing something about it. The, the mistreatment that these folks went through on the behalf of others is just tremendous. And I encourage you to look, learn more about that um, and learn and accept the fact that it is not a movement that can be won or can be changed by one group solely. It is going to take a body, the beloved community to change. And that's what we had here. We look at Selma and um, we look at the, the, the um, uh, Edmund Petty Bridge. Um, and the collective of people that are there. We look at other pictures regarding our, our uh, uh, protests, um, silent passive protests, the, the, the collection of people that have gathered there also to walk for this right. We look at these people standing together knowing that there's going to be violence, knowing that there's going to be mistreatment knowing what's going to happen, but standing together and fight. That is called the beloved community, a community that stands together for what is right and helping to establish um, uh, the, the needed values that all have legally uh, been given and deserved. Um, we look at how all were treated and knowing that you, when you're walking in and standing up for those rights and protesting nonviolently, that you were going to possibly receive that. That was going to occur to you, but standing up and doing it anyway. Ongoing silent protest. Um, again, looking at the population in that group, they were not all African-Americans. Uh, they were a, 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 a beloved community that stood up for what is right. And that was the, that's, I, that's what Martin Luther called upon and I think that that's what we need to call upon yet still today. I think our church is calling upon that, uh, that we as a community of Christ uh, need to establish and be that beloved community and right what is wrong and recognize and open our eyes, open our eyes to the changes that need to be made um, in our community, open our eyes to voices that need to be risen for those who have been silenced and open our eyes and do something about that. Um, so in, in uh, 63, uh, Dr. 62, Dr. King had a meeting with John F. Kennedy regarding the civil rights movement and regarding legalisms as to that need to be changed and enforced and what was going on down south. And then although a law had been changed, we have blatant people, George Wallace, Connor, the chief of police, others down south that said, blatantly to the president of the United States at that time, I don't care what the law says. We are not going to change down here. We believe that people, Negroes have their place and we are gonna keep them in their place. And so that was made very clear to them. 
Kennedy did not like that. And as we know, he sent a National Guard and others to help establish a, pe a peaceful town and help enforce the laws of the land. Now, next we have the I Have a Dream address. And uh, I'm gonna show this after lunch. We're gonna take a break, 11.30, take a break and go to lunch and come back at 12.30. And I'm gonna show this, but there's some things I'd like for us to, to think about as we prepare to, as we prepare to watch that. And there are some questions that I'd like for us to discuss after we have watched that. My key thing is what five things King visualized in his I have a dream address. Obviously, I'm having some work done on the outside windows of my office. So um, sorry for the, 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 the disruption. Um, so are there any other questions before we take a break at this time? Any questions before we take a break at this time? Or statements or anything? Uh, Vince, I, I was just wondering about the, uh, the concept of, of direct action and how that fits into nonviolence. Uh, uh, I, I feel like sometimes in the, my own life, you know, my, my head and my heart have been in the right place, but my hands and my feet have perhaps not. Um, how, how, how can the church um, maybe learn from Dr. King and his concepts of nonviolent direct action and, and how we need to be, you know, putting our hands and feet in, into motion uh, and make this more than just about words? Um, yeah, thank you, Glenn. Um, um, I'm going to say this about that and try to be very uh, hopefully safe uh, because this is, this is obviously being recorded and I do not want to step on any toes that are going to um, be cause a, a, a be anti productive to our goal here. One of the things I'm going to stress. <clears throat> is vote. And it seems pretty simple in regards to voting. And it is pretty simple. But the fact is the outcome is dramatic. It's, it's a big deal. And not necessarily just voting, but whom are we voting for? I think we as citizens who have the right to vote, the right to choose, who live in a land in <coughs> in which we choose our political leaders need to be cognizant of what are those leaders that we are choosing are thinking, are feeling, and directions that they are leaning towards. As an example, um, there are some new public laws that are going to affect yet as we speak and are being discussed that are going to limit, for example, this presentation right now. This presentation would not necessarily be acceptable in the public school uh, to students uh, uh, because they would feel that it talks about and, and pointing the finger at a, an, an oppressed group and pointing the finger at an oppressor group and is stating things like that we do not and cannot say anything that may falsely accuse a group of people who had no responsibility for a current situation. And therefore, it would very much limit the type of education that we can provide regarding where we are and where we have come from and our past and where we need to be. It would definitely limit that. So when I talk about vote, if we are aware of a politician who will have power to make the decisions such as these, that that politician may have some views that are, uh, are socially questionable, if you will, that we should let our vote reflect how we feel about that. Um, so voting is very, very keen. 
The second thing is your voice. Again, <clears throat> I keep talking about voice. Um, we sit too silently for too long. Again, um, King mentioned in fact that it's not going to uh, surprise us in the end about the noise and the rump, the, 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 the ruckus that our enemies make. What's going to surprise us, disappoint us, and break our hearts is the silence of our beloved community, of our friends. But if we are to be a truly beloved community, we will raise up our voice and say, this, this is wrong. We cannot do that. Uh, we must um, silently, gently protest and stand, at least raise a voice and say that this is not acceptable. And for far too long, we have not raised a voice and said anything is not, nothing. We have not raised a voice to say this is not acceptable so that the, the, the supporters of that belief of that, of that treatment <laughs> will continue to do such because they believe that it is right because no one has said otherwise. Whether that voice is simply at the dinner table with, with grandma, grandpa, uncle, whatever, Bob, who says that those people are such and such or that group of such and such, and you know differently when you sit there and say nothing and you, uh, or you then are encouraging and supporting the negative comment that has been made <coughs> as opposed to saying, that has not been my experience. Um, I don't believe that to be true. And I don't believe that way. Um, and you don't need to push back hard against a person or a family member or whatever that believes a certain way, but you need to at least have the nerve to be able to say, I, I don't agree, I don't support that, or that has not been my experience. And there's more that can be done as such a question. In response, I'd just like to inject something here. There was a book that uh, one of our congregations has used for book study entitled Healing Resistance. And it's by Kazu Haga, H-A-G-A. -A. And direct action is the fifth step of the six steps of nonviolence. But rather than try to go into any detail now, I do recommend this as a worthwhile um, follow up to this presentation. The author has said, my life and training in the nonviolent legacy of Dr. King. And I will put the information, the book title and the author in the chat. Right. Okay, thank you, Gwen. Are there others? Uh, seeing none, uh, we are going to take break for lunch at this time, and uh, I'd like for you to think about the I Have a Dream address, and uh, we will be watching that immediately after lunch, and then responding to some questions and your thoughts regarding that. Hopefully my work will be done by then. All right, let's take a little <laughs> 1230. Thank you, Vince.